Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 146, and I'm reading the first two verses. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Good morning, and a great big welcome to our service today where we have gathered to praise to worship and just become silent at the foot of the cross i am indeed honored to spend this time with you today and truly just to bring you the word of god once again but before we get started may i inquire as i always do on how you are doing are you still coping are you still managing to survive in these difficult times at present in our country? Well, always remember, there is a much higher power that really can help you. And his name is Jesus. Just reach out to him and he will help you. And of course, if you are needing any help or assistance, please do not hesitate to call the church or to myself, or to Anthony, or Derek, or Marion, and we will gladly assist you wherever we can. So please, no need to, to continue suffering on your own. The church is there to try and help. I have one announcement. Please take note that our Thanksgiving concert is on the 29th of November, Friday the 29th. Please, tickets are available at 30 Rand plus a plate of eats at the church office or after the service on Sunday. Carl will be sitting at the back and he will be selling tickets. If you haven't got your tickets, please grab them quickly, quickly. Uh, time is running out as we get closer to the Thanksgiving concert. So come, let us do what we came to do, and that is to praise, to worship, and just hear the Word of God. Our first lesson today comes from the book of Ruth, and I'm reading chapter 1, and I'm reading 18 verses, verses 1 to 18. It's the whole story of Ruth and Elimelech and their two sons so please bear with me i know it's a long reading but i can't leave anything out that's how important it is so hear the word of god in the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land so a man from bethlehem in judah together with his wife and two sons went to live for a while in the country of moab the man's name was elimelech his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. 
May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, but it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Then Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her. She stopped urging her. Please join me for a time of prayer. Come, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we greet you, Lord, as we, we come before you today, praising you and worshipping you, but also, Lord, approaching your eternal throne. Truly what a privilege and what an honor it is to know that we are all part and parcel of your family and that you adopted us, Lord, and made us family. But at the end of the day, Lord, you are the creator, the eternal creator. And it is us that you created. And therefore we belong to you. I know, Lord, we wandered off. But through your son, he has reconciled us with you once again. O oh Lord, we worship you and we praise you as we celebrate this wonderful day where our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, rose from the dead and conquered death and conquered sin and has taken authority over both good and bad. But Lord, as we come before you today, Lord, we know that in a week gone by, we have sinned against you, Lord. We have not been obedient to your call. And we have not loved one another as you intended us to be. So, Lord, as we come now, in our silence, we want to confess our sins to you. We pray, Lord, that you hear them now. Oh, dear Lord God, you assured us of our forgiveness, Lord. You promised us that if we do repent, you will forgive us, Lord. And we know that you are true to your promises. And we proclaim that today, Lord. And we know that your promises are true and that you are faithful. Oh, Lord, help us to realize that you have forgiven us. And that we need not have any emotions or feelings of guilt because you, the Almighty God, have forgiven us now, Lord. O oh Lord, as we go into a world, let us not stand back, but rather 
Let us look at the world in the eyes and say, Almighty God has forgiven us. O oh Lord, we thank you that we can approach your eternal throne in the name of Jesus, knowing that he has set us free, that he has redeemed us, and that once again we are reconciled to you. So Lord, we praise you this morning, and we just come worshipping you, Lord. O oh Lord, as we gather today, we just want to pray that you will hold us tightly, that you will bring a peace and a calm upon us. And Lord, as you speak to us today, we pray that you open our hearts and open our minds, that we may be receptive to everything that you say. O oh Lord, and as I bring your message to these, your people, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take total control over me and that each and every word of meditation that flows from my lips will be yours, but that those words of meditations will bring you honor and glory at all time. So, Lord, we pray, be with us now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our second lesson comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, and I'm reading verses 11 to 14. Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, it is not part of his cre this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. I read so far. May the Lord bless to us his holy word today. Folks, as I so often do, when I start my message, or the message that God has given to me to give to you, I like starting with a question. And today's question, although you may think is a silly question, is a very relevant question for us today, as it was in the years of biblical times. And my question is, why do we as human beings complicate Christianity. You know, we make it so complicated. Have you ever spoken to people that say to you, you know, I don't like this Christianity because Christianity is full of do's and don'ts, full of regulations and rules. And you know, those rules and regulations and do's and don'ts actually bog you down. They hold you down. And, and, and a lot of people are of the opinion that because of those do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, a person cannot get any joy out of life. Life is then more of a burden than what it should be. And yet, Jesus says to us, but yet... When we hear the message of Jesus in so many scriptures, Jesus says, my yoke is light and I have brought you joy that your joy may be complete. And yet, we as human beings come with so many ideas, so many things that we actually deprive people 
of Jesus. Now, when I say this, I want us just to look at our text today. We have the wonderful story of Elimelech and his wife Naomi, and they stay in the promised land which God has given them. But then times in the promised land are not that good because firstly there is a famine in other words a drought so there's no crops there's nothing and they don't have food the second thing is that they were staying there in the period of the judges now remember i said to you a long time ago when we talk here of the judges we're not talking of Judges like we know a judge today sitting on a bench um, judging a case whether a person is guilty or not. No, these were the judges who were people that were hired by the Israelites to protect them. Because you had the sea people, you had many people that would come and would come and scavenge their crops and their animals and they would steal them and by the end of the day, they had nothing of their crops left. So times in Israel were tough. But also, according to the scriptures, Israel had turned away from God. And they were doing their own thing. Oh, we know there was a lot of crooking carrying on. There was a lot of things going on. For example, remember I told you some time ago that when people came to buy grain, that they would cheat them by using different types of weights on the scales. And that's how they were making their money out of this. And they actually turned totally against God. And it's on the back of this that Elimelech and Naomi decide to go to the land of Moab. Now, also on top of that, Moab, Moab was the country that decided not to help Israel in these difficult times against the judges. So there was quite a lot of animosity between Israel and Moab as well. And yet, this is where Elimelech and his wife Naomi decide to go there. Now, he has a problem already because the land that God had given Elimelech, he now leaves and he goes. So he goes away from God and he goes into a foreign land where he will be alienated from his people, people of Israel. But when he gets to the land of Moab, there he and Naomi have two sons. And both those sons, Malon and Kilion, they, they marry. And they marry two Moabite women, which is Orpah and Ruth. Now, I just want to pause there quickly. Now, Deuteronomy 25.5 says that you should be marrying a Jewess not a foreign lady and despite that in Moab the two sons marry Moabite ladies but tragedy doesn't stop and we see in this text you see a dichotomy of things happening. You see affliction versus comfort. Now the affliction, yeah, is that within 10 years staying in Moab, then Elimelech passes away. And when he passes away, remember, the law of the Jews is a divorced woman may not marry again. So she stays with her two sons and her daughters-in-law. But within 10 years, 
Not only does Elimelech die, but his two sons, Malon and Kilion, they also die. And there they are left, ladies alone in a foreign country. Now remember, they were the two sons, Naomi and Elimelech, were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. And yeah, they're staying in a totally, totally foreign country. None of them have got a husband, and they are left over to themselves. Remember the biblical times those years was that a woman had no locus standing within society. They couldn't possess property. They couldn't do anything. But yet they had to live. And how would they do this? Remember, one thing that stands out here, although Naomi is in a foreign country, where Judaism is not being practiced, Naomi never, never, ever forgets God. She clings to God, even although she's an alien in a foreign country. She clings to God, and she holds on to Him. Although she says in one stage in the text, God must be angry with me. He's turned His hand against me. But as they are there, with all the affliction, we also find that there is a basement. A basement meaning embarrassment. Because it was also firmly believed that if you lose your husband and your sons, it is through sin that this is caused. And, and that is not true. But because of that, Naomi decides, and she hears, that God has blessed Israel with food. And what does she do? Immediately when she hears this, she goes back to her country of origin, back to her God. And as she leaves, she tells her two daughters-in-law, listen, I'm going back, but you stay here. Go back to your parents and go and worship your gods. Where I'm going, I'm going to worship my God and I'm going to be with my people. Now, Orpa, yes, and very sadly, agrees with Naomi and she goes back to her folks to her parents. But Ruth, who we believe has met God through Naomi, says that I will not leave you no matter what. I am going with you. And she also says to her, and when I go with you, I will also worship your God. So in other words, God here yeah, has obviously touched Naomi and touched Ruth, and that is why she's going with. So you see, folks, the problem comes even in this time where Ruth and Naomi lived. The Levites had already started adding laws to the law. In other words, we had the Ten Commandments that came from God, but yet the Levites and through the years the rabbis added laws to the Ten Commandments. It is believed that in the time of Naomi and Ruth that there were already over 600 laws. And remember I said to you in a modern day society, there are over 6,000 laws already. And if you go and read in Deuteronomy 25 verse 5, we see that a divorced woman 
may not marry a different man, but only the brother of the late husband. So in other words, yeah, we have a problem. You have Naomi who has lost her husband. And she's not, sorry, I spoke incorrectly, not divorced, but widowed. And yeah, you have Ruth, who's also widowed. And the only people they may marry are the brothers. And yes, a problem, because Naomi's other son has also passed away. So there is no more brother to her late husband. Naomi's brother or husband is gone. So what happens now? We all know this wonderful story of how Jesus leads Ruth to Boaz. Now, I don't want to preempter next week's sermon, but we know that this has happened and that Ruth goes to Boaz and God prompts this whole thing. But why am I talking about this? It's to show to you that through human beings, They've added laws to the Ten Commandments, making it extremely complicated and difficult to live by. The great news for us is, is that Jesus has come to set us free. It says that he is the high priest of the good things, and he is already here. And he sits in the perfect tabernacle. That's our text for today from Hebrews 9. What is that perfect tabernacle? That means he's in heaven with God, sitting at God's right hand. And what is he doing? He's interceding on our behalf. Now we've got to stop and think. We, we said in the year now, you must remember we don't know exactly when it is that Elimelech lived. But we do know that Moses lived approximately between 11,000 and 12,000 before the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, taking it a little bit, we, we, we guesstimate, yeah, around about 9,000, maybe 8,000 before the birth of Jesus when this was. And, and please, that's just a pretty good guess. It's not definite. But then already, human beings had already started adding to the laws of God. And when that happens, no longer what God intended for the people to be is happening. Because the laws that are now there, and in a modern day society over 6,000, of that 6,000, 5,990 were given by God. The rest are all man-made. And that is why Jesus speaks out here against a tabernacle that is made with human hands. A tabernacle that is there and the blood of goats and calves, which is for the outward appearance. But the inside of human beings is controlled by the Holy Spirit and by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus sits there interceding for us. And now I wonder if how many of you have ever stopped to think. And I've mentioned this many a time. If we take all ten commandments. How would we summarize them into one word? That one word would be love. Now, what did Jesus say? What is the greatest commandment? You know, he doesn't talk about this interrelational marriage. He doesn't talk about a divorced woman cannot get married. He doesn't talk about all those other things. But what he does talk about, he says the, mo the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And then he adds on, and to love one another just as he has loved us. 
So you see, you take all ten commandments. You can go through them. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why not? Because you love your brother whose wife it is. And because you respect him and love him, you will not commit adultery with that person. Or you will not commit adultery because you are married and you don't want to destroy the love between your wife or your husband. Thou shalt not steal. Why not? Because you'll be stealing something from somebody else and therefore you do not show love for that person. And so I can carry on and on and on. So all these other man-made laws, which Paul speaks out and refers to them as the laws of sin, are almost impossible to follow. And that is why Jesus came. And when he went to the cross, he said his blood is a sign of the new covenant. The covenant between Jesus and us. And what is that covenant? Is that we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. There are no more of all these other Levitican rabbinical laws that are relevant to us to this day. I mean, where have you seen, if you go to your loved one who's on deathbed and your loved one dies or passes, and whilst that one passes and you were holding that person's hand whilst they passed, according to the Levitican and rabbinical laws, you are unclean. So if something happens to you that night, according to that law, you have a problem in getting into heaven. And Jesus says, no, you are already saved. And the greatest, greatest proof of this is that Ruth, who is a Moabite woman, who is a Moabite widow, eventually marries an Israelite. And from that Israelite, and from, and from Ruth, we have the descendant of David. And from the descendant of David is Jesus. So Jesus' ancestry traces back to a Moabite woman who marries an Israel husband against all human rules and laws. Folks, I want to end off today by saying to you, do not complicate Christianity. All that Christianity is about is loving Jesus Christ, loving God the Father, and loving the Holy Spirit. In other words, loving the triune God. And when you do that, that is all you need to do because you, your name, is then written in the Lamb's book of life. Believe in Jesus Christ. Love him and allow him to work through you. His yoke is not heavy. His yoke brings joy and peace. Amen. Come let us pray. Oh dear Lord God, we have heard your word to us today, Lord. And yes, Lord, how foolish of us just to complicate and just to add to, to what you have given to us. Oh Lord, we see that the old law with all those laws is, is not what you meant for us. But rather you gave us the Ten Commandments, Lord, to save us, to keep us safe, and so that we could love one another, Lord. And that is why you gave it to us. Oh Lord, help us not to fall into the strap of clinging to tradition and laws that have been made by human beings, but rather just to turn to you and ask for your guidance, Lord, because truly that is what we need. 
Oh Lord, we thank you that your yoke is not a heavy one, but a light one. And that you bring joy to us. You bring life to us. And that we thank you that it is through your masterful plan that we've been set free of that law in the name of Jesus. Oh yes, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. But Lord, we pray that as we go out into the world this week, that you will go with us, that you will shine through us, and that people will see your love, and that we, Lord, will not complicate things, but make them much lighter. So, Lord, we pray as we go into the world that you go with us, and that you be with us. And we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Folks, once again, that brings us to the end of our service for today. So receive now the blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Wishing you a wonderful week. Remember, when the going gets tough, just reach out to God. He is always there to help you whenever. So, until we meet again, stay safe, stay healthy, and always remember that Jesus is only a prayer way. Goodbye.